don't even own it. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Well, not, in my not, opinion, not, no, in my not, not ownership in the sense of like they own your soul, but yeah. ownership in that they have control but, of. Thank you. Ruslan is finally getting to the point. He is. He's heard all of the words, the whole word salad that Isaiah used, and Ruslan is getting back to the the purpose of this conversation. Aww. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Drew from the Doctrines of Rad, and today I'm going to actually be looking at a video and adding some commentary to uh, a video that Ruslan KD did with Isaiah Saldivar, who is known for his deliverance ministries. Uh, and this discussion got a little bit, it get, got a little bit heated. It wasn't a, it wasn't a big argument or a debate. Ruslan came away from this still, you know, claiming Isaiah to be a brother. Um, I have a lot of concerns with the things that Isaiah Saldivar uh, says, the things that he teaches, the way that he speaks about holy things, the way that he speaks about God, uh, and. I don't want to throw everything out there of what I believe right off the bat, but let me just say that if your focus is not on proclaiming the gospel for the salvation of people, because the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And when Jesus gives commands to his disciples, he says, go into all the world, baptizing proclaiming this gospel and teaching people to be obedient to the things of God. That is the Christian's mission. That is what evangelism is. That is evangelizing. Um, that is our sole focus as believers is to glorify God in everything that we do and share the gospel with others so that they can also receive the forgiveness of their sin. That's the focus. As a Christian, if you aren't explaining to people the gospel, if you aren't telling them of God's word and his history and showing them that they too can be forgiven and they can have an eternal life with Christ, if that isn't your main focus, I don't know what kind of ministry you are doing. So we're going to jump right into this interview. Uh, Ruslan is asking Isaiah uh, his opinion on basically can a Christian uh, be demon-possessed? And Isaiah doesn't really give a straightforward answer here. He's, he kind of seems to say uh, he doesn't believe that. And then he goes on to tell a story where um, a, allegedly this woman that he's talking about uh, maybe wasn't a Christian. But I'm going to let him go ahead and speak, and I'll pause and comment as necessary. Bruce Lawn. Your position is that a Christian cannot be possessed. No. Possession, okay, here's my position. So let me first talk about the Christian, I don't think. Okay, so again, I don't think his no answer was saying that uh, no, a Christian cannot be possessed. Uh, it's vague. He may be saying no, they can. He's going to go into trying to explain his position here, uh, and it just kind of gets muddled from here. I think they're really a Christian. Mm -hmm. I had a pastor's wife of a large church I was doing a training at a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and this is the senior pastor of a, of a large church, well known. So this is not like you know the third associate down on the sure. youth group. Sure. She came up to me and said, "I heard your teaching on deliverance. I did leadership like, and they had John Maxwell the year before. Yeah. So John Maxwell to me, I told him I was like, bro, I'm coming in.' Yeah, so, so, so it's a weird, it's a weird name drop, but you know people people like to do that. They like to say, and I've I've been guilty of this before too, you know." Look at how I was asked to preach after a man such as John Maxwell the year before was asked to come to this event. Uh, maybe that's not his heart. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but we'll see. Big contrast. That, that, well, he was teaching leadership and he's like, can you come and teach deliverance? I'm like, bro, I'm not near, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that's a whole different world, yeah. but he wanted to. So I was like, fine. So I yeah. taught his pastors. We were in Tennessee, but the church is not in Tennessee. It was a yeah. retreat. Yeah. So the pastor wants him to come in and teach on deliverance. He doesn't want to do it, but he does it anyway. I'm sure the money was good. His wife comes out to me after, because we were like, we're going to pray. Whoever needs deliverance, we'll pray for you. Mm -hmm. These are all pastors, by the way, mm -hmm. only pastors. Mm -hmm. And his wife said, Isaiah, crying for 25 plus years, every Sunday when my husband's preaching, I hear curse words in my head. Mm -hmm. I hear something saying, F God, blaspheming God, mm -hmm. tear your Bible, blaspheming. Because that's, that's another symptom of you hearing blasphemy, mm -hmm. blasphemous thoughts. Mm -hmm. the all right, so hang on a second. So he's talking about a symptom of demonic influence or oppression over someone. He's trying, he's making the connection. He's saying that hearing thoughts that are cursings and blaspheming of God are a sign of 
some sort of demonic oppression. I would love to see his his scripture. He's going to add a scripture here. It's not really going to uh, exactly answer the question, but here we go. The Bible says in Revelation, the beast is written blasphemy all over him. Mm -hmm. She says, I hear this. Now, do I tell her you've been in ministry for 25, 30, 40 years, however many? This guy's mm -hmm. traveled the world, all that, and you're not a Christian, honey? Mm -hmm. Or do I say, maybe there's something there? Yeah. So I just said, let me pray for you. I don't care. I'm not here to tell you whether you're a Christian or not. I could care less. That's on you. Sure. I'm just going to pray for you because that's yeah. what I've been called to do. I've yeah. never, yeah. there's no other. So, okay, so he doesn't care about, his point being that uh, it doesn't matter whether this woman was a Christian or not, he was just going to pray for her. So in his, in his battle, his, his trying to figure out um, what he's doing, he's offering to, uh, or he's, he's making the connection that maybe she's not a Christian and that's why this is happening, or maybe she is a Christian and that's why this is happening. Either way, this is happening and he's going to pray for her. The scripture where it says, I should determine whether you're saved or not. Yeah. I'm not the judge of no one's salvation. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know whether you're saved yeah. or not. I can't tell you that because yeah. I don't know you. But you are called, Isaiah, to proclaim the gospel to every single person. If you are casting out a demon over an unsaved person, what is going to happen? Are you teaching them repentance? Are you teaching them to deny the flesh, to refuse sin, to hate sin as much as God hates sin? Or are you simply cleaning a house for someone and leaving them to fill the house on their own? The Bible is clear. Jesus's own words on demonic activity are very much in line with what Isaiah is saying. However, the problem is that in the instance of the strong man, where Jesus talks about the strong man being overtaken and his stuff being plundered, if Jesus is the strong man in your home, then nothing else can plunder that home. In fact, there is a verse in the Bible that talks about, there is a parable in the Bible that talks about a demon who is removed from its dwelling place, going out, gathering up several more demons, coming back to find that the place has been clean, and now moving back into that home and taking up its residence. So if you are in the business of delivering people that are not saved, you are just simply removing a demon from a home without installing the strong man to protect that home. Who is the strong man? Jesus is our strong man. If the Holy Spirit has taken up his residence in you, if you have proclaimed the lordship of Jesus Christ and repented of your sin, the strong man that lives in you is God himself. So the danger, without presenting the gospel to people, if you are just simply walking around casting out demons, you are doing nothing for the kingdom of God because that demon will go out and gather seven more and return to that home and find it cleaned because Isaiah, you cleaned the home. You cast out the demon and did not proclaim the gospel. And I'm not saying Isaiah didn't proclaim the gospel. That's the question that I have is in the midst of all this deliverance, in the midst of all of these prayers, are you proclaiming the gospel in order to solidify the foundation, to clean the home and establish that Jesus Christ himself is the strong man in this home? Yeah. So I prayed for her and she started screaming, manifest, and she yeah. got full on delivered. Yeah. My point of it is for someone to come up to me vulnerable and say, I think I need deliverance. The how do you know that this person is full on delivered? How do you know that the devil, if this is a demon, has not tricked you to believe that this person has been delivered? Because they put on a show? Because they screamed violently? Do you know if this person has a history of mental illness? Have they been to a doctor or a psychologist to discuss 
what may be cases of schizophrenia, voices in your head. And I'm not lim I'm not saying that humans and Christians don't have intrusive thoughts. The Bible is clear that we do because the Bible gives us something to do with those intrusive thoughts. It says to take those thoughts captive for Christ. I picture it as a going up into my brain, grabbing that intrusive thought and surrendering him to Jesus and saying, Lord, th these are not good thoughts. These do not edify the body. They don't glorify you. Let's keep going. The last thing I'm going to do is say, oh, maybe you're not a Christian. Yeah. Like, that's so wild. Yeah. Sh shouldn't you, though? Shouldn't that be one of the very first things that you ask someone needing deliverance is, do you know who the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is? Have you heard of this gospel message, which is the power of God to salvation? Delivering someone is like cleaning their home without giving them the tools on how to keep their home clean. The second they get back, it's going to be messy again. Yeah. So now instead of attacking the demon, yeah. I'm putting your salvation on the chopping block yeah. and being yeah. like, maybe you're not safe. So yeah. I just wanted to touch on that. You can't put anybody's salvation on any chopping block. The Lord, salvation belongs to the Lord. The Bible says it in Jonah, it says it in Proverbs, salvation belongs to the Lord. There is nothing you can do to take away, to remove, to diminish the salvation that the Lord has given to his people. Matt, I don't really get in the weeds. I would take the stance that like Sam Storms has a really good like studious article on this. Um, the stance is this, possess is not a biblical reality. There's in the Greek language, even in the Hebrew, there is no word that denotes demon possession mm -hmm. and that is an ownership of a demon okay mm -hmm. so just i'm gonna make it very basic so there's no principle or idea and sam storm says which i love he's like what does the devil own we mm -hmm. could even debate that does the mm -hmm. devil own anything mm -hmm. so i think he's wrong here and i like sam storms quite a bit i don't think that this that's the message that sam storms is getting at uh, in fact again using the scripture specifically all right so let's take a look at what it says in the bible in matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. It says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my home from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. This is Jesus's own words discussing the nature of demon possession. Because it says right in verse 5, the last state of that person is worse. Isaiah, this is a warning to you, brother. If you are delivering people from demons without pro proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are making the state of that person whom you have delivered worse. What are you doing? Playing around with spiritual power is not something that we should take lightly. This is not meant for you to have some sort of authority. All of this is done by the glory of God. And if you are not careful, you will fall into a trap. Brothers and sisters, the Bible has been written, canonized, and solidified for a reason. If we cannot find scripture to show the things that we say about God, then you must reject those things. And that has been the biggest complaint about almost everything I have against the things that Isaiah says. He is not using scripture to back up and solidify his points. He is regurgitating things that other people have improperly taught over the years. He is piecing together texts to make his point because guess what, guys? Isaiah makes good money delivering people.
Isaiah makes good money selling his CDs on Sid Roth's TV show. Isaiah makes good money delivering people and emptying their home of demons and not establishing a new strong man in that home. Let's keep listening. I don't know. I can't find one verse where it says the devil has ownership of anything. What has Satan been given? Satan has been given dominion because Adam forsook his role. Because of the sin of Adam, the Bible says in Romans 5.12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Adam traded his dominion, his high priestly role, to become like God, and Satan then began to rule because sin and death entered into the world. On top of all of this, the devil may very well not even be one specific being. Almost every time that Satan is mentioned, the enemy, the adversary, they are mentioned in scripture, it is used in a plural form. Similar to how the word Elohim can mean one, but many, it's a plural use in the form. The best possible interpretation of understanding Satan would be to call him the Satan or Ha Satan, which is found in Hebrew. The Satan, the evil, the principalities, the spiritual forces in dark places, all of these uh, titles given to these dark forces on the earth. Satan has dominion on the earth until the point that Jesus Christ comes back. Now, that doesn't mean that Satan has ultimate authority. We know that in Scripture because Jesus at his ascension says, all authority on heaven and earth has now been given to me. So all authority belonging to everything that we see, it all belongs to Jesus. But Satan is still in dominion, working against the things of God on the earth. So to make a semantic argument about possessing and what does Satan own, Satan has been given some role on the earth that God has allowed to take place because it ultimately will bring about him the most glory. It will bring about to him the most honor. We see this in the book of Job when the Satan goes and accuses Job in front of the Lord and says, well, it's just because you're protecting him. But if you took away your protection, I know he would deny you. And what does God do? You can, you can take what you want. You cannot take his life. God gave Satan permission. God has also given Satan a sense or a sort of dominion on the earth. Satan may not possess like a case of chapstick, right? But Satan and his demons can most certainly dwell in the bodies of human beings in some way, shape, or form. So how could the devil own you or possess you? Mm -hmm. So possess isn't biblical when it comes to, let me be clear, when it comes to a person having a demon or being demonized. Mm -hmm. Oppressed is also not a biblical reality when it comes to a person having a demon. So oppression is absolutely a biblical reality. The idea, just because the word oppression does not exist in the scriptures, does not mean that spiritual dark forces cannot have an influence over the minds, the souls, the hearts of human beings. Just because the word doesn't exist in the Bible does not mean that the concept of spiritual oppression does not exist. Paul tells us to take up the whole arm, armor of God. What does the shield of faith do? We hold it up to quench the fiery darts of the devil. That is 
oppression. Again, you can't just say things just because they sound good and believe that people are going to listen or buy what you're saying. So daimonizomai, which is the Greek word, we've all sure. debated this, it literally means, if you Google this, it'll say usage to be under the power of a demon. Now, what guys will do is they'll say, well, this is the new, this is the translation, the King James 1611. The, they yeah, translated possessed. it to possessed. Mm -hmm. That's not the translation. It's to be under the power of a demon. So here's what I do. I say, we're going to go with the original Greek, which is to be under the power of a demon. And, mm -hmm. and again, Sam Storms has a crazy studious article on this. I don't believe in possession. I don't believe in possession. I believe people can have demons. Doesn't matter if you're a Christian, if you're an atheist or you're a cat. A, mm -hmm. a person can have a demon. Okay, so I don't know if he was being jokey about the whole cat thing or not. Um, wh so what does it mean, Isaiah? If, if we're going to nuance the word possession and oppression, and yet a Christian can have a demon, what is that? They just, like a purse? They carry him around? What does that mean that they can have a demon if it's not oppression or possession? These people like this will get into the weeds with words and they will confuse you to the point where you're not even sure what you agree with anymore. He has used so many words in just three minutes of film that no one is really sure what Isaiah is talking about. Does this not raise red flags for Christians as believers? Let's keep going. And if a demon's there, then we're going to cast the demon out of you. Yeah, just so based on what though, Isaiah? What Bible verse? Where is the scripture? Where is the scripture? For, to back up all of these things, show me in scripture why you operate the way that you do. I just looked up the word and it- Yeah, it'll say usage to be under the power of a demon. To be under the power of a yeah, demon. Yeah, because possessed is not a Greek word. It's literally mm -hmm. not. And that's what Sam Storms argues. Derek Prince argues that. There's a bunch of guys that would agree with it. But that's kind of like the orthodox taken deliverance is there's no there's no possessed in the Greek. Like mm -hmm. the word possessed doesn't exist. It's mm -hmm. translated in, in the King James Version. So right. that's done a big So you're disservice. saying it was a mis mistranslation? Well, no, it's translated into a word that, an English word that means to have ownership. And there's no word that means to have ownership in the Greek when it comes to demons. Gotcha. So it, it, I wouldn't say it's a mistranslation. I would say there's not a word in the English can, that Can describes. a demon have ownership of a non-Christian? So we're three minutes in, and Isaiah has done nothing to solidify any of his argument. He has used verbal gymnastics to bounce around the idea, to, to give validation to his own narrative, and has not used any scripture to back up or validate the rest of his claims. No. No, demons don't own anything. What they does a demon own? Okay. No. Okay, okay. Well, not, in my, not, opinion, not, in my not, opinion, not ownership in the sense of like they own your soul, but yeah. ownership in that they have control of thank you ruslan is finally getting to the point he is he's heard all of the words the whole word salad that isaiah used and ruslan is getting back to the the purpose of this conversation of a, your a, body a, not a, 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 an a, autonomy autonomy, autonomy. Yeah. No, i don't think so don't think i've so. met okay. a few people that are very deep in the occult one guy spent 30 years in brazil uh -huh inviting demons into him and i did deliverance on this guy this is all this is a rare 0.1 percent guy uh -huh. that was 30 years in the jungles of brazil inviting uh -huh. demons that were 30 feet tall in his mind sure. into him and he's like they take over my body i'm not going to debate you i think at that level that's a special circumstance maybe a demon can take over your body i've heard serial killers say yeah. i blacked out you've probably heard this sure, i blacked sure. out i woke up and they were dead maybe but the 99 percent of people we do deliverance on there ain't no demon able to fully just take fully over and start no I wonder what the Catholics would say about what Isaiah is saying. You know, exorcism has been traditionally a part of the Catholic Church for a very long time, and I, I would actually, I would be, I would be shocked to find out that uh, the Catholics would agree with Isaiah here. And I don't agree with the Catholics on most things, but it's a very interesting perspective. Again, I have to go to the question: based on what? Based on what, Isaiah? Based on what scripture? Experiences are fine. I don't question that you are driving out demons. I do question on whether you are replacing those demons with the Lord by sharing the gospel with people. It's very strange to me to, to cast demons out of people without sharing the gospel 
with them. And particularly without sharing the gospel with them first, just walking up to somebody and casting out a demon, um, what does that do? Who's, who's being called to repent? Who are we draw who are we calling to repent? The demon to repent? The person to repent? Is the de- is the person to repent for what the demon made him do? Is that the way that repentance works? There are so many unanswered questions in this. 